Yeah, the, um, oh, hi. Welcome, well, um, welcome to the, uh, the last IJS lecture for the autumn 2020. Uh, we have only three more weeks left for this semester, and I hope you are all doing well. Today, we have Professor Aiko Takeuchi uh, Demiaji of the Adakochi uh, University. She kindly agreed to share her research with us from Turkey. She will give a lecture for about 40 minutes and there will be a QA session afterwards until 3.30. If you have questions, please post your questions in chat or ask questions directly to Professor Takeuchi uh, during the QA session. Today's lecture is not only the last lecture of autumn 2020, but this is also the last lecture that I host as the interim IJS director. From January, Professor Naomi Fukumori will be the new IJS director. So I'd like to ask Professor Fukumori to introduce Professor Takeuchi Demiaji today. Professor Fukumori, please. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Itzio. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Yuasa uh, for her leadership of the Institute for Japanese Studies um, as interim director this semester. And moreover, for her seven years from 2013 to 2020 as the director of Ohio State's East Asian Studies Center. As many of us personally know, she immeasurably enriched East Asian studies at Ohio State over this time. I look to her example as I prepare to begin my appointment as director of the IJS this coming January. My guiding mantra is, what would Ezio do? <laughs> Today, I'm pleased to introduce to you our final speaker in the autumn 2020 IJS lecture series. Dr. Aiko Takeuchi Demirci joins us, as uh, Dr. Yuasa mentioned, from Istanbul, Turkey, where it's currently around 10 p.m. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Demirci, for making the time to speak to us on what will be a very, very long day for you. Since January 2020, she has been an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Koç University, where she also serves as the co-director of the Center for Asian Studies. Dr. Takeuchi Demirci is Senior Associate Managing Editor of the Journal of Transnational American Studies and Editor of Notches, Remarks on the History of Sexuality. Dr. Takeuchi Demirci earned her PhD in American Studies from Brown University. Her research interests are in Transnational American Studies, U.S.-Asia Relations, Modern Japanese History, Women's and Gender Studies, ethnic studies, immigration studies, and science and technology studies. Her research interests are very, very broad and transnational. Her book, Contraceptive Diplomacy, Reproductive Politics, and Imperial Ambitions in the United States and Japan, published by Stanford University Press, was awarded the 2020 John Whitney Hall Book Prize for the best book on Japan published during 2018. In the words of the Hall Book Prize Committee, Dr. Takeuchi Demirji's book, quote, impressed the panel as an innovative and comprehensive study of the transformations of birth control discourse over time, rich in detail and broad in coverage with a transnational approach that suits its subject. Contraceptive diplomacy places Japan in the context of the global history of gender studies, racial eugenics, population policy, and imperialism. The book provides a fresh sense of the 20th century through its exposition of the interwoven fabric of the history of feminism and international relations, revealing the inextricable links and extended interactions between Japanese and US birth control activists. By placing Japan in a broader global context and showing scholars of other locales why they need to pay attention to Japan in terms of this immensely important yet understudied topic, Contraceptive diplomacy will appeal to both Japanologists and those well beyond our field." Unquote. Dr. Uh, Takeuchi Demirji's talk today is entitled, entitled, excuse me, The Eugenic Protection Law and the Promotion of Eugenic Marriages in Post-War Japan. Please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Takeuchi Demirji to The Ohio State University. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Dr. Fujimori, and, um, and thank you, Dr. Yuasa, 
and also Stephanie, all for helping me out. First of all, inviting me to this lecture and making the process very easy for me. Um, it is a great pleasure to be able to talk to you and everybody here and share my work. And out of all the difficulties and suffering from the pandemic, this might be one positive thing that I will be um, able to um, give a talk um, in the United States virtually from all the way across the world. So I really thank everybody for inviting me and making this possible. So um, let me first share my slides with you. Okay, I hope you can see it. So um, as Dr. Fukumori introduced, um, the title of my talk is the Eugenic Protection Law and the Promotion of Eugenic Marriages in Post-War Japan. And this is taken um, from, partly taken from the topic of my book, which was also introduced by Dr. Fukumori. So, a woman living in Miyagi Prefecture knew that her sister-in-law had received eugenic, sur eugenic sterilization surgery when she was about 16 or 17 years old. One day, she re requested for details about the information regarding her sister's surgery. The ledger recorded that her sister received surgery for hereditary mental weakness. But she had heard from her mother-in-law that her sister became mentally handicapped from the anesthesia she received during a surgery at the age of one. And the disability certificate also noted that it was not hereditary. Her sister had, had suffered from chronic abdominal pain throughout her life as a result of the surgery. And she also had difficulty finding a spouse because she could not have children. So in two, 2017, the, this Miyagi woman attended some hearings held by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, but the deputy, deputy director there repeatedly told her that eugenic sterilization was legal at the time. So in early 2018, she decided to file a lawsuit demanding the government to apologize and provide compensation to the victims. Similar lawsuits have followed, and so far eight have been filed in district court and one in the high court. These lawsuits made a lot of headlines in Japan and people were reminded of the law that enabled these surgeries, the Eugenic Protection Law of 1948. In this talk, I will explain the social and political context surrounding the enactment of the Eugenic Protection Law in post-World War II Japan and examine how and why such law came into effect. I will also compare the meaning of eugenics in Japan to the situations in the United States and other Western countries and show how eugenic discourses and measures became no normalized and even justified as necessary for the good of the nation and for the Japanese race in order to survive the post-war turmoil. The Eugenic Protection Law, or ETL, was enacted in 1948 with the aim of preventing the birth of unfit offspring while protecting the health of the maternal body, as stated at the very beginning of the law. The, imme the immediate purpose of the ETL was to control the rapid increase of population in the post-war years 
by providing women with easier access to abortion and birth control. In fact, the Eugenic Protection Bill was originally drafted by three bureaucrats in the Socialist Party, who were also active supporters of Japan's birth control movement. One of these members was Kato Shizue, formerly known as Baroness Ishimoto Shizue, who was one of the first female members to be elected to the Diet, which is the Japanese legislature, in 1947. In my book, Contraceptive Diplomacy, I feature her transnational birth control activism, along with Margaret Sanger, her American counterpart. And the two appear in the cover photo of my book here, which was taken in 1936 in Japan. The birth control movement in pre-war Japan gained some momentum and popularity, especially after Ishimoto and other Japanese activists invited Margaret Sanger in 1922. However, it became increasingly subjected to censorship and crackdown as the government promoted pronatalism during the war years and suppressed any subversive activities or so-called dangerous thoughts. The official stance on birth control turned almost 180 de degrees after the end of World War II. Now faced with the post-war baby boom and the loss of outside territories after losing the imperial wars, a population policy became a national priority in Japan. It was in this context that birth control advocates suddenly gained the support of the national government. In reality, however, opposition to birth control remained strong, especially among bureaucrats. Some opposed it for moral reasons, but most of them still cherished, cherished the notion that the more the people, the prosperous the nation was. So in order to sell the need of birth control as a national policy to the conservatives, it was necessary for the leaders of leaders supporting birth control to frame it in a language that they all agreed, which was eugenics. Eugenic ideas permeated the birth control movement since the pre-war decades. This was the case pretty much everywhere in the world, including the United States. In fact, you could even say that it was because of the worldwide popularity of eugenics at the time that birth control was able to gain the support of leading professionals and intellectuals. And as I also argue in my book, many eugenicists in the US and Western countries promoted birth control, especially to the overpopulate, op, overpopulated countries in the world, usually meaning the colored races, including Japan, as an effective solution to poverty, food, shortage, food shortages, and even wars. However, as eugenic discourses became increasingly tied to political propaganda and discrimination in the 1930s, many Anglo-American scientists started to distance themselves from the old school eugenics, what um, historian Daniel Kevels calls mainline eugenics, emphasizing instead scientific objectivity and political neutrality. Especially after the Nazis eugenic sterilization law and the genocide of the Jews, many in the West became extremely cautious about any association with eugenics. That doesn't mean that they 
all of the sudden abandon every eugenic thought and research. But instead, the field was reframed and reinvented as genetics on the biological aspect or population studies on the social science aspect with the emphasis on numbers and statistics rather than quality or judgment. The situation was a little different in Japan, however. First of all, Japan was one of the Axis countries along with Germany, so they didn't have the strong sense of rejection of Nazi Germany that the Western countries had. In fact, a lot of the eugenic studies and policies in Japan were modeled after those in Germany as well as those in the United States. The eugenic protection law itself was in essence a revision of the wartime national eugenic law of 1940, which was modeled after the 1933 sterilization law in Germany. However, the German law in turn was modeled after sterilization laws in some US states. So you can't really make a clear line between the eugenic policies in the Axis countries and those in the allies as much as some wish to do. The eugenic prote protection law actually reinforced the wartime eugenic law by expanding the list of so-called hereditary diseases, many of which were not actually hereditary at all, that were targeted for eugenic sterilization. And this is a point that both liberal and conservative diet members agreed upon. The wartime law was not actually effective because it went against the government's overall pronatalism. So supporters of the eugenic protection bill hoped that this new post-war law would more effectively implement these eugenic policies. Now, all laws during the occupation period had to go through the approval of the occupation government. Some American officials actually raised concern of, over the strong eugenic tone of the EPL, not so much from their concern for Japanese people targeted by this law, but because many officials worried about the diplomatic implications the possible criticism from the Soviets that the Americans were actually committing genocide against the Japanese. In the end, however, they approved the bill because they feared that overpopulation and consequent social and economic instability in Japan could, in, could turn the nation red. Many US officials actually actively supported these population policies in Japan, but rather covertly by emphasizing that all the, all the initiatives came from the Japanese themselves. So the main sponsor of the bill, who was a conservative physician and bureaucrat, actually removed a key component in the original bill cr created by the socialist members, which was the clause on birth control, presumably because birth control was seen as basically an individual act and therefore could not be fully monitored by doctors or officials. The EPL that eventually passed legalized therapeutic abortion and sterilization after the approval of the Eugenic Protection Committee, which consisted of physicians, social welfare workers, 
judges and bureaucrats approved and appointed by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. The law actually forbade women, especially middle-class women, from seeking these operations for personal reasons. In the revision of the law a couple of years later, they removed the approval process by the Eugenic Protection Committee and added back the provision on birth control. But these changes were not meant to give women more control over their bodies, but instead to give doctors more control over them. Abortion and sterilization were now under the sole discretion of state approved doctors. While state approved field workers and midwives would instruct rural women on simpler methods. In short, this seemingly liberal law, one of the first of its kind in the world to legalize abortion and birth control, was actually designed as a eugenic policy to ensure that the poor and the disabled would control their fertility and that the middle-class woman and the fit would continue to reproduce for the nation. The national leaders and doctors further disseminated this eugenic idea of reprodu reproducing or not reproducing for the nation through the mass media. From women's magazines to popular genetics magazines, by promoting the idea of eugenic marriages. This concept had been actively promoted by the government during the war years in order to create a healthy and fit race. The government established eugenic marriage consultation centers where the counselors instructed soon to be couples or newlyweds about the genetic background of each family or possible hereditary issues appearing in their offspring. Their role actually resembled the, that of go-betweens in arranged marriages called nakodo in Japanese. And the image here is um, taken from a booklet published by the health ministry to be used at these consultation centers which explains the meanings and purpose of the national eugenic law. And this particular page shows the 10 instructions for a eugenic marriage. Similar genetic counseling center offices started to emerge in the United States around the 1940s, but these were increasingly treated as part of the medical practice. Whereas in Japan, these consultation centers were usually located in department stores and other commercial areas as part of women's consumer citizenship, to use um, Jennifer Robertson's word. So here again, in the United States, you can see the disruption from past eugenics practices and more emphasis on medicine and science. Whereas in Japan, you see more continuities from pre-war to uh, pre-war and uh, wartime practices and policies and eugenics being part of a wider consumerist culture. At the same time, in post-war Japan, these eugenic discourses were wrapped in the new language of democracy and modernity and individual choice. 
These experts often called for the rationalization or scientification of marriage in this new democratic Japan. They often warned of the danger of misinterpreting freedom and democracy, blinded by the kind of romantic love depicted in Hollywood movies. Many were concerned about the spread of venereal disease as a result of the loosening of morals among young people. It was therefore important more than ever that these newly liberated women in Japan became equipped with scientific knowledge about marriage, hereditary, and birth control. As I mentioned earlier, birth control is essentially an individual act. And so the experts needed to guide and educate these women to take responsible choices in reproduction for the sake of the family and the nation. These discussions usually took place in middle class or intellectual magazines. Leaders wanted to educate these women for responsible reproductive choices, but they also wanted to reach people in the rural areas. They considered these rural people as having too many children in a poor environment, thereby lowering the overall quality of the Japanese race. Therefore, they sent midwives and field workers to instruct them directly on the idea and methods of birth control. Some of these rural people rejected these nationalist rhetoric and policies interfering into their intimate matters. Others simply took advantage of these nationwide campaigns making birth control available to many women. And just to note here that these post-war campaigns targeted women specifically and not necessarily men. The resulting rapid decrease of birth rate in Japan, as this graph shows, was quite remarkable. Public health and population experts interpreted these results as an indication that birth control had diffused to all social classes, including the laborers and the rural poor, who supposedly needed birth control the most. Internationally, Japan had become a model country for many policymakers demographers and public health workers across the world working to combat global population explosion in the post-war decade. Now, going back to the matters of eugenic thoughts and the eugenic protection law, because the EPL and Japan's population policy were hailed as a model for battling global overpopulation, it was for the most part shielded from critical examination in terms of human rights and reproductive choice. For the Japanese government, having solved the crisis of overpopulation, reproductive issues fell out as a priority policy issue. Groups representing disabled people in Japan, however, have long objected to the eugenic principles in the EPL. But it was only in the 1990s that these groups partnered up with feminists and demanded for the removal of eugenic languages and content from the EPL. 
the, the momentum for this campaign actually came from the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo and the 1995 UN Women's Conference in Beijing, both of which for the first time placed reproduction in the realm of women's rights and health rather than in the framework of global population control. Feminist activists successfully used these outside forces to pressure the Japanese government to take action. And as a result, finally in 1996, the name of the law was changed to maternal protection law. But even with the name change, not much had been done to address the past issues of abuse. But there was a separate but related development concerning the issues of forced sterilization, abortion, and quarantine of leprosy patients. In 1998, a group of recovered leprosy sufferers filed suit against the Japanese government in the Kumamoto District Court and several others followed suit in the following years. As a result, in 2001, the court ordered the government to pay compensation to the victims and Japanese leaders including then Prime Minister Koizumi Junichiro made formal apologies. The 1990s actually saw a series of cases that sought apology and compensation from the Japanese government, including the so-called comfort woman issue or um, Korean and Chinese forced laborers and non-Japanese atomic bomb survivors. But these leprosy cases were the first time that the Japanese government was actually ordered to pay compensation. Meanwhile, in the United States, past sterilization abuses, especially targeting women of color, came into public light as more and more studies revealed the coercive nature of so-called population policies in third world countries, as well as in Southern or Western states in the United States. In 2003, North Carolina became the first state to officially apologize for past Patient abuses and offer compensation. Sorry, I disconnected, right? Looks like yes. I disconnected. Yes. Um, could you tell me from where you, um, you couldn't hear me? Where was I? Do you remember what I was talking about when I 
got this connected. I think maybe just only last three minutes or so. Okay. Hello. Hello. I think, uh, Dr. Dimirci, um, I believe you yes. were talking about the cases in the United States. Okay. Okay. So let me just repeat there just in case. Um, let me see. My slide is it appearing? Is my slide appearing? It says that you're at, you're at the end of the, sh the show, so you may have to go back oh. up the slides. Maybe I went too much. Okay. All right, so let me repeat about this part about the um, ster sterilization abuses in the United States as it became, um, came into public light more and more, as more and more studies reveal the co coercive nature of so-called population policies in the, the third world countries, as well as in some of the um, southern and western states in the United States. And in 2003, North Carolina became the first state to officially apologize for past sterilization abuses and offer compensation for the surviving victims. But these allegations of forced sterilization and reproductive abuse still seem to be an ongoing issue in the United States as we hear news of abusing going, abuses going on in prisons and more recently about the hysterectomies without consent in ICE custody. So the recent, going to the, re these, the recent sterilization lawsuits in Japan, but they might not be directly related to the, these developments in the United States, but also in Japan, in the past years, there has been more attention to the matter of disability rights. In, and in, so in 2014, the gover Japanese government finally ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which came in effect in 2008, thereby becoming the 140th country to do so. Even so, there wasn't much attention from the media or the public about this move. What did cause more national attention to the issue of disability rights, I suppose, is the stabbing that took place at a care home for disabled people in Sagamihara City in Kanagawa Prefecture in 2016. 19 people were killed, becoming one of the worst mass killings that occurred on Japanese soil since World War II. So when the first lawsuit was filed against the Japanese government over sterilization abuses under the eugenic protection law, the Japanese media closely followed the development of the case and more and more victims came to speak up. As a result, in 2019, a relief act was established, which allows lump sum payments to individual victims along with an apology from former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. But less than 3% of those eligible have been approved for the payments so far. As for the lawsuits themselves, so far two rulings have been made at the Sendai District Court and at the Tokyo District Court. They both acknowledged that forced, forced sterilization done under EPL was an infringement of individual rights and unconstitutional. However, they stopped short of providing compensation, citing the statute of limitations. As I have illustrated in this lecture, it was a gradual and slow process 
that some of these victims were finally able to speak out and demand their right and rights and respect. And the majority of them still remain silent. This is because the idea of reprodu reproducing healthy and fit off offspring for the nation, what Susan Burns has described in her recent book on leprosy as biological responsibility, has been so pervasive that those who were deemed as unfit, unfit felt stigmatized and shamed even to disclose the fact that they had been sterilized. When we just look at the actual percentage of people who were sterilized or received abortion for eugenic reasons, they consist only a few percent of the total number of people who received these operations under the EPL. In fact, lawmakers back then were disappointed that very few actually obeyed to the principle of the law and underwent eugenic surgery and that the majority of women actually having abortion and sterilization were in fact quote normal and fit. In other words, despite all the principles and rhetoric that lawmakers and experts had presented, the eugenic, protect, the eugenic protection law was largely ineffective as a eugenics law. That doesn't make the pain and stigma of those who did receive eugenic treatment insignificant. On the contrary, it just shows how difficult it has been for them as a minority to have their voice, voices and stories heard and to speak up against societal expectations of biological citizenship. So that will be the end of my lecture part and I will welcome any comments as well as questions. So it seems that the, the other, we do not have a questions in the chat section, but the other, if you, you have a questions, uh, please raise your hand or uh, uh, please ask him a question. Ah, so it uh, seems like uh, the other, Professor Miyazaki gave the other question. Um, so I will read it then. Uh, in the U.S., uh, eugenics uh, led to the, uh, the immigration policies and labor laws, including uh, minimum wages during the uh, so-called uh, progressive era. Uh, what, um, were there any social economics legislation or law that EPL promoted in Japan? Um, 